the years, the land our forefathers settled is no longer strange, and the reluctant earth they fought yields freely of its bounty. There is leisure to be enjoyed, and life is good. Oh, right. Beauty, beautiful stuff. Industry expands, and trade flourishes. There is work for craftsmen and artisan, for laborer and artist. Knowledge and learning are available to all who seek them. Then a city reaches maturity. And it is then that its people have the time to search for the things they could not find in the pioneering of a raw and difficult land. It is then that people welcome an adventure of the mind and spirit. Such an adventure is the Adelaide Festival of Arts. Artistic director of the festival is John Bishop, elder professor of music in the University of Adelaide. And on him falls much of the immense task of planning the festival. To it, he brings the inspiration of long established festivals in countries overseas. Organizing a festival of arts is no joke. Not even in the great cities of the old world, where this sort of thing has been going on for centuries. And where the great artists of the world, musicians, painters, sculptors, actors, spend most of their time. And where recognition and support of their work is part uh, of a general tradition. Here, in a comparatively small and geographically isolated city, the whole community must contribute in some way if a festival is to come to life and mean something to everybody. First of all, you must have a strong board of governors, prominent citizens who will give an enthusiastic lead, who can influence other people to organize and cooperate, and above all, to guarantee the large sums of money that are needed to make the festival fully representative of the finest in all fields and facets of art. Well, gentlemen, I think at this time we got down to business. This board of governors does the overall planning for the festival but delegates the detailed work of organization to dozens of individuals and subcommittees. As the weeks pass and the tempo quickens, more and more depends on the chief executive officer, Charles Wicks. He needs to be wonderfully efficient and quite unruffled, for on him and his staff falls all the responsibility of administration. Then, the Tourist Bureau deals with hundreds of requests for accommodation and with every conceivable kind of inquiry, reasonable and unreasonable, from members of the public. And with tickets to issue and reservations to make for over 100 performances in two weeks, the booking office is really busy. And so is that essential figure, the public relations officer. Firewall speaking. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Hmm. Hmm. Yes, that's fine. Oh, yes, if that's all you want. Yes, there's a big banner going up in King William Street right now. As the opening day of the festival draws near, the whole city goes gay. Streets and squares get a new look. natural that a group of 16th century Venetian figures should be lounging outside the Freemasons Hall. Inside, costumes are being tried on for Ben Jonson's play, Volpone. <laughs> 
and in a special setting in the round, producer Colin Ballantyne is in the thick of rehearsals. All right, the two judges and the clerk of the court, where are you? Come along now. All right, everybody, on deck, please. Stand by now, come along. In position, please. All right, where we go. I humbly thank your followers. Soft, soft, whooped and lose all that I have. If I confess, it cannot be much more. The fox shall hear on case. Why, patron? I am Volperni. This my name. This his own name. This avarice is fool. This is a chimera of wit all fool and knave. And reverend fathers, since we all can hope not but a sentence, let's not now despair it. You hear me brief. May it please your fatherhoods. Silence. The knot is now undone by miracle. Nothing could be more clear. Or can more prove of these innocent? Give them their liberty. Heaven could not long let such gross crimes be hid. Disrobe that parasite. Who oh, strayed father's speech. All right, hold it, everybody. <coughs> now, you've got to remember that this is theater in the round. There are audience on all four sides of us. And this, this applies to the judges, it applies to everybody. It applies over here. You've got to turn, give the full value of the face right round the complete circle. At the Theatre Royal, Stefan Haag rehearses one of Adelaide's most brilliant guests, South American Anna Raquel Sartre, in the lead in La Traviata. Sorry, but you, you must come further on before you start singing, yeah? Yes. We've got a proscenium here. We're not in the round, and there are customers on the side, and they pay too. And I, 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 before, there's something else. When he comes in, you must be pleased to see him, will it? Huh? Call huh? the doctor. Yes, he's also, don't forget, the only person who still comes to see you. Uh, all the rest, your, your money's gone, your admirers are gone, your health is gone. We hope your voice hasn't gone. Yeah. Uh, so please, right? Jeez. Have it again, Brian, please. Now remember it. Sentite. Soffre il mio corpo, ma tranquillo l'alma. E questa notte... Hold it. Uh, yes. Please don't anticipate the pulse taking. Let him uh, pick your hand up, yeah? E questa notte... E questa... E questa notte... E questa notte... Coraggio dunque... La convalescenza non è lontana. Rehearsals are not all indoors, for many events are to be held in the open. On Sunday morning, the strolling couples in Elder Park can see national groups rehearsing a composite Australian folk dance, based on dances of the countries from which they have come. <laughs> While at the Union Hall, producer Richard Campion tries out lighting and sound effects for another major production, J.B., the American verse play based on the Book of Job. One, two, three, four, five. Voice of God, test. Voice of God, test. Testing one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one.
Testing one, two, three, four, five, five, four, six, one. Last minute adjustments to the flood lighting make the city as gay by night as in the daytime. And final touches are added to Adelaide's special joy, the carpet of flowers. <laughs> to come to Adelaide, is to come to a garden that has invaded a city. And to arrive at festival time is to be an honored guest. At railway stations and at the airport, visitors are welcomed with a bunch of flowers. And who so churlish as not to wear it for at least a day? Flowers are everywhere. Sir Malcolm Sargent, here to conduct the London Philharmonic Orchestra, receives a carnation for his buttonhole, grown for him in his host's garden. In this city of gardens, this city of flowers, Zoe Caldwell, the Australian actress who is to play Bernard Shaw's St. Joan, finds special cause for delight. And this one, Miss Caldwell, is the best of them all. It's going to be named St. Joan. St. Joan. Oh, how marvellous. And it is to this city of gardens, to this city of gay, decorated streets and buildings bedecked with flowers, that at last the Governor-General of Australia comes to take his part in the festival and to declare it open. has come when everything is ready and public imagination soars in the excitement of the great occasion. Therefore, with the greatest pleasure, I declare this festival open and thereby light a beacon which will shine not only all over Australia, but will cast its beams across the world. Night and day for two weeks, 
under sunny skies or starlit skies, in theatres, halls and galleries, the people of Adelaide and their visitors will throng to watch and to listen. At Centennial Hall, the highlight of the opening night is a grand concert, and half Adelaide has come to hear Sir Malcolm Sargent conduct the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Tonight's concert will include Brahms' double concerto in A minor for violin and cello with local soloists Vladislav Jasek and James Whitehead.
Art exhibitions are on view throughout the festival. One exhibition at the National Gallery of South Australia shows Australian art from the beginning to the present day. The pioneers of painting in this country are included in this representative collection, together with many of our own contemporaries. The pictures have been lent by many galleries and private collectors. After the festival, they will be sent to London for exhibition at the Tate Gallery. The Prime Minister is present at the public library to open the Nan Cavell Collection of Australiana, now the property of the nation. I'm delighted to be asked to open an exhibition which has its permanent value in the record of Australia. But I think perhaps I ought to say a word or two to you about Mr Nan Cavell, who has chosen to become the most remarkable collector in our time of Australian pictures and papers. At the Elder Hall in the university, the music lover may hear all Bach's 48 preludes and fugues played by outstanding Australian pianists like Ronald Farron Price of Melbourne. And anyone who can make an hour to spare may slip in, even at the last moment, to hear South Australian violinist Carmel Hackendorf play a concerto by Paganini. Clemens Lesky plays a sonata by Scarlatti.
For the newspaper critics of Adelaide, doing justice to the whole range of events is a man-sized job. Any copy, sir? No. Oh, yes, you can have this. Well, that's all till after the late concert. <clears throat> 120 shows to cover in a fortnight. It's a bit thick, old boy. Before we've finished, we'll have a sporting man on a jazz concert and a social girl on the ballet. At Boniathan Hall, Norman Philbrick's production of Shaw's St. Joan marches inevitably towards its climax, as Joan of Arc faces her judges. If I were to dress as a woman, they would think of me as a woman, and then what would become of me? If I dress as a soldier, they think of me as a soldier, and I can live among them as I did at home among my brothers. That is why St. Catherine tells me I must not dress as a woman until she gives me leave. When will she give you leave? When you take me out of the hands of the English soldiers. I've told you I should be in the hands of the church and not left night and day with four soldiers of the Earl of Warwick. Do you want me to live with them in petticoats? My Lord, what she says is God knows very wrong and shocking. But there is a grain of worldly sense in it, such as might impose on a simple village maiden. If we were as simple in our village as you are in your courts and palaces, there would soon be no wheat to make bread for you. That is the thanks you get, Brother Martin, for trying to save her. Joan, we are all trying to save you. His Lordship is trying to save you. The Inquisitor could not be more just to you if you were his own child. But you are blinded by a terrible pride and self-sufficiency. Oh, why will you keep saying that? I've said nothing wrong. I cannot understand. The blessed St. Athanasius has laid it down in his creed that those who cannot understand are damned. It is not enough to be simple. It is not enough even to be what simple people call good. The simplicity of a darkened mind is no better than the simplicity of a beast. There is great wisdom in the simplicity of a beast, let me tell you. And sometimes great foolishness in the wisdom of scholars. We know that, Joan. We are not so foolish as you think us. Try to resist the temptation to make pert replies to us. Do you see that man who stands beside you? Your torturer! The bishop said I was not to be tortured. You are not to be tortured, because you have confessed everything that is necessary to your condemnation. That man is not only the torturer, he is also the executioner. Executioner, let the maid hear your answers to my questions. Are you prepared for the burning of a heretic this day? Yes, master. Is the stake ready? It is, in the marketplace. And the English have built it too high for me to get near her and make the death easier. It will be a cruel death. But you're not going to burn me now? You realize it at last. There are 800 English soldiers waiting to take you to the marketplace the moment the sentence of excommunication has passed the lips of your judges. You are within a few moments of that doom. Oh, God! Do not despair, child. The church is merciful. You can save yourself. Yes. My voices promised me that I was not to be burnt. St. Catherine bade me be bold. Woman, are you quite mad? Do you not yet see that your voices have deceived you? Oh, no, that is impossible. Impossible? They have led you straight to your excommunication and to the stake, which is there waiting for you. Have they kept a single promise to you since you were taken at Compiègne? The devil has betrayed you. The church holds out its arms to you. It is true. It is true. My voices have deceived me. I have been mocked by devils. My faith is broken. I am dead and dead, but only a fool 
walk into a fire. God, who gave me my common sense, cannot will me to do that. Now, God be praised that he has saved you at the 11th hour. Night after night, the crowds make their way to Festival Fair in Elder Park. Performances range from the traditional ballet, Les Sylphides, danced on a stage floating on the Torrens River, to the modern rhythms of Graham Bell and his jazz men, which set all hands clapping and all feet tapping. Quite different is the Maori song by the choir of almost 200 voices from Christchurch, New Zealand. There is time for leisure, too, in the mild Adelaide evenings, 
for hard-worked organizers and critics, and musicians, actors, authors, and artists. In Professor Bishop's garden, they meet each other and relax. Here, local artists can meet international artists from countries all over the world. They come together in Adelaide for a few days and may not meet again for years. So it is an opportunity to exchange experiences, to hear the news of people and places they have not seen for a long time. It is a chance to voice opinions and discuss theories before the time comes to move on to other cities and other audiences. Relaxing with Australia's animals is another famous guest, naturalist David Attenborough. After his morning lectures to groups of children about his experiences in many lands, he has a chance to make new friends in the animal world. A keen group of students during an informal hour has cornered another guest, world famous figure in the field of jazz. Mr. Brubeck, how do you get a swinging rhythm in your jazz when you use a complicated time signature like 5-4? All I can tell you is that in our group, we've played enough five now so that we don't count. And when that happens, you have a natural swinging effect in the time signature. Now, I'll, I'll show you a 5-4 a that I think swings. It's I would call it Castilian blues. It's in 5 4 ten. <laughs> See if you can swing in five. Just count one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Are you ready? One, two, three, four, five. You can't swing. It, it, it's hard for people to understand five. It's a funny thing. Uh, we have a new thing in 11 4, which throws everybody, <laughs> including us. Uh, to me, these, these swing very naturally. Uh, but it's because we're playing now in these new time signatures. At first, they weren't natural. And you can start improvising. The literary side of the festival is not forgotten. Novelists, poets, dramatists all find their way to Adelaide, and many poets and writers read their own works in the open air. The first week of the festival is Writer's Week, and all the problems and achievements of Australian literature are reviewed and discussed. Later, a conference of playwrights organized by UNESCO studies the prospects of developing a national drama. No festival is a festival without children. When Noah's Flood, the medieval miracle play set to music by Benjamin Britten, is performed in a church, the animals, which two by two troop into the waiting ark, are the children of Adelaide. Come along now, all animals into the ark. Lest it was a fall, the beasts were installed into the ship. The flood is nigh, you may well see, therefore, carry you not. Carry you not. Carry you, carry you not. Carry you not. Here, 
In every activity, weeks of work and rehearsal are showing themselves in polished performances. At the Theatre Royal, La Traviata awaits her death with resignation. For many, one of the highlights of the festival 
is a performance of the Mozart Double Piano Concerto by a group of leading Australian players conducted by Yehudi Menuhin. Pepsi Bar Menuhin and South Australian Lance Dosser are the soloists. <laughs> Any festival, alas, must end. For those who have borne the burden of its organization, this festival of arts has been a triumphant reward for their work. For the people of Adelaide, and for the visitors from other states of Australia, and from countries overseas, it has been a rich and stimulating experience in which they have participated. They have felt the concentrated excitement of the festival open up whole new worlds of experience and appreciation to audiences and performers alike. Other festivals will follow. And though for another two years, the city may revert to its well-ordered ways, it will never be quite the same. For a flame has been kindled in the hearts and minds of its people that can never be extinguished. Mm -hmm.